some questions answered around remote patient monitoring. As um, Corey just stated, I, my name is Tina Thompson. I am a registered nurse. I've been working in as a nurse for 25 years. So I've worked in many different areas of um, healthcare and I've watched how the landscape of healthcare has changed over that time. With remote patient monitoring, we all know a few years ago, it, uh, when remote patient monitoring came into play, it wasn't really re as reimbursable by um, CMS as we're seeing it in 2022. Part of that is that COVID has really pushed us into that technology, technology world where we're using more of the telehealth solutions and some, some home monitoring devices to help us really take care of those patients. But in that time, we also saw that it was making really significant impacts on patients' chronic disease processes. So we use the remote patient monitoring in episodic care, and it really did move us over into that preventative care module. Um, we know that RPM is reimbursable service, and it has to use technology. It has to have technology flowing from the readings from the patient's home into a system where we're monitoring and we're having some communication back and forth with the patient. It applies to acute uh, conditions as well as chronic conditions. Sometimes the patients are going home after being in, in the hospital. During that hospital stay, stay, they've been diagnosed with an acute episode of something that may be a chronic condition, but that's the first time they've had an exacerbation of that. So then it, we're starting in the acute care phase, but we're pushing that into that chronic management. Um, the adoption of um, RPM really had doubled from 2018 to 2020. We saw it went from 10 to 20%. And I can tell you in the past two years, we're probably seeing it double again. We see a lot of physicians adopting this technology, one, because the, the amount of the patients and the acuity of the patients in the home, sometimes they cannot come in as regularly, they're having more problems, the patient, the physician may have a booked schedule, and we were seeing physician burnout. This allows us to really engage the patient in the home and help them be part of their process of healing. We saw in 2020 some of the three top uh, practices that really grew in the RPM sector was going to be cardiology, endocrinology, and diabetic specific physicians. So we separate endocrinology and diabetic for a reason. And they did that because in endocrinology, diabetes we know is part of endocrinology, but the monitoring part of um, the way we're able to build RPM under diabetic education and whatnot already had codes but RPM just couples with those codes. So can we move to the next slide, please? We always wanna talk about what's the benefit for the practice and the patient. Um, as healthcare providers, the first thing is always our patients. We wanna provide better care to the patients. Um, the patients are more likely to stay with the physician because they feel really engaged with the physician. They're having conversations outside of just their regular office visits. Um, 60% 6, of them were more likely to show up to their appointments because they were been discussing that there's been problems. How are we going to move from point A to point B? And we can have, they come back into the practice because they feel like, you know, okay, so we've been going through this. Let's look at this again. Um, they're more compliant with their care plans. Um, patients, I think sometimes in the past, even as a nurse, I have found that patients don't necessarily want to be non-compliant. They just don't know how to navigate the system. They go home, they get a blood pressure cuff. It gives them this reading. They feel like they're failing at what the physician has asked them to do. So they get frustrated. They stop utilizing it. With RPM having a nurse to call and say, hi, Mr. Smith, I see your blood pressure is higher than it was yesterday. Let's walk through redoing this again. Have you taken your medications? Have you know? Are you having some additional stress? Do you have anything that is going on at this present moment, looking at the symptom management behind that as well, really allows the patient to feel like we're engaged in what's going on in their day-to-day -day activities. And they become more satisfied with the access to a response of a, of a clinical staff member. We like to present it as this is a, you know, we can get, we're gonna get more into this in further slides, but this is an, an, an arm to the physician's office and an extra person that you can reach out to. And, the, the patients really, I think, appreciate that. They really, they see that as an investment into their health. The practice benefits, 
of course, we want our patient outcomes to improve. We've always wanted to our patients' outcomes to improve. However, we feel like you know medicine, unfortunately, has become a business, and you have to meet certain criteria in, our, in order to get proper reimbursement. We also get penalized as healthcare providers that patients go back to the hospital, they go to the ER, and then you get penalized because they've had an admission in the past 30 days for the same diagnosis. Um, CHF patients, that's a, hu that's a really huge population um, out there in society that their symptoms can literally occur in a very short period of time if the proper monitoring isn't going on. And they do drive a lot of the inpatient care in the ER. We find that patients will adhere to the care plans that the physician has talked to the patient about. We're providing information during the, the visit. Some of us are even printing out what that information would be. The patient goes home and the patient gets kind of lost. And I think all of us can say we've had a patient or we've done it ourselves who gets a new diagnosis or gets some information and they go to Google or they go to WebMD and what they are reading is maybe different than what you, you might have wanted them to do based off of their personal, um, the personal issues, the personal profile, where they are. And then they, they get frustrated or their neighbor will say, well, I have that same thing and my doctor didn't tell me to do that. Having that engagement with the nurse just increases the compliance there, right? We wanna make sure that we're decreasing the mortality among our patients. And these, these programs can help us do that. We wanna look at the clinical workload and burnout within the practice. Um, one of the biggest things we'll cover today is how practices say, how do I adopt this program without overwhelming my staff? My staff is already <clears throat> overwhelmed um, or right now, I know a lot of hospitals and practices are having a hard time bringing on new employees. They just, the, the market for um, staff is, is very thin right now in a lot of places. So to think about that, it's one more thing they have to do, then we may shy away from putting this into place, but there is a way to do it. And it achieves cost savings per patient, right? So the patient overall, if we look, the patient goes to the ER, we know that we have a healthcare burden of cost and we want to start decreasing that cost. So how do we do that? We start giving the patient options to be part of their care plan. Does it 100% prevent the patient from going back to the hospitals? No, but it does curb. We can grow the practice's profitability. That's to me always second. Average practices can add over $100,000 a year. They can stop patient attrition and increase their E&M visits, and they, they can reduce no-shows because the patients are engaged. And it also increases the patient satisfaction as we've talked about before. Next slide, please. So what are the challenges of implementing RPM? From the practice side, short-staffed. The physician and staff already are at a level of burnout Patients are becoming sicker and sicker these days. They're more complex. There's more things going on. Device management and support, they're like, what am I supposed to do with this monitor? I can't, I don't have room in my practice to store these monitors. I don't have the ability if one's not working to support getting that exchanged. And there's this whole process that goes behind it. The billing part of it is, is newer. Um, the codes are out there, but how do I meet the elements of the code to make sure that I'm coding appropriately and I don't set myself up for audit? Um, and added patient care and communication. So the patients will be contacting you or the, the, for re their readings, or they may call you to say, hey, um, my, my monitor's not working. And they also, you're getting the reading, so you're needing to reach out to the patient and maybe look at what's going on. The, on the patient's challenge side, it's learning a device. Um, I know so many patients who will have blood pressure cuffs, they have them for a long time, they don't um, properly change all the batteries, they don't properly um, reset them, or something happens, they've dropped them multiple times and they're getting erroneous readings. So they're treating, someone will self-treat themselves, give themselves an extra dose of medication or something, and maybe that blood pressure isn't right and we need to walk through how to get an appropriate blood pressure. 
Um, data connectivity has been a problem in the past. Most of these devices were uh, really worked off Wi-Fi. Um, cellular has come into place during the past two years, whenever we've had COVID and RPM devices um, need went up. A lot of these uh, device companies have went out and created higher uh, integrity relationships with the cellular companies. So they have extended band coverage in rural areas. They may put up smaller uh, cell uh, towers or uh, cellular antennas in the homes to make sure that we're able to get the data across to the software itself. And of course, there's always language barrier. Um, we are a cultural melting pot in the United States. There's a lot of cultural diversity that needs to be um, thought about when we're putting these, these programs into place with our, our practices and our physicians. So moving forward, what is the reimbursement? Um, reimbursement in some of the codes bumped up a little bit this year. A few of them bumped down just a little bit by like $1.24. So our codes, you know, 99457 would be our 20 minutes, um, our base 20 minutes with the patient. That's meaning that we, that's not 20 minutes that you're on the phone with the patient. That's 20 minutes of taking care of the readings, any um, education you're sending forward and patient communication. And then you would be able to do the 99458, which is every additional 20 minutes you speak with the patient. And that is unlimited. This all needs to be documented you need to be able to show that you've had the readings, that 16 readings is what you need to capture to do the 99457 as well. You have the readings, you're capturing the readings, you're capturing, um, there's communication between yourself and the patient or a proxy in the patient for the physician to be able to get these built. So $52 for the 457, $40, these are rounded up or rounded down to be whole numbers. Um, 458 for the additional 20 minutes, there is a 99091, which is you know, going to be 30 minutes of the physician or the practitioner, maybe a nurse practitioner's time. Some practices do elect to do that. Some practices do not elect to do that. Um, the 99454 is the devices. That's the monthly fee for the devices that you that's reimbursable. And there's a um, one-time setup fee of the 99453. That's one time in the life of the patient. So we need to be very cautious when we're talking to the patient. Have you ever done remote patient monitoring before? Because that may not be a billable code for that patient if they're transitioning from one program to another. But um, CCM, a lot of times, which is chronic care management, which it's not what this particular webinar is about, they tend to run hand in hand with one another because most people with the chronic conditions can also benefit from having chronic care management coupled with that. And they saw really significant increases, about 25% increases in their reimbursement rates this past um, year. So we like to put that in there because there are ways to make the reimbursement higher in the same population you're serving with the RPM. So if you looked at a revenue estimate on RPM for your patients, just looking at the device and just looking at the time and reoccurring, reoccurring um, per patient, at 100 patients, the practice could bring in an additional $130,000 in revenue per 100 patients if all elements are met. Next slide, please. How does Health Prime fit into this? I have been working for Health Prime and its um, sister companies for about five years. I have been doing chronic care management and care management programs for about nine to 10 years total in that working in different capacities and that I've worked for place for companies such as Humana, who they do have their own care managers that they put out in communities, um, to building chronic care management programs for large institutions like MedStar. So when I came to Health Prime, we talked about value-based care and how value-based care really is where um, healthcare is moving. Whether we want it to or not, it does appear that that's the, the way that it's moving. So I was, I went to my CEO and I said, I think we need to find a way to help support our practices. These practices are talking about, we really would like to do this. We just do not have the staff. So next slide, please. We were able to develop a 100% managed care RPM program. We have certified clinicians. All of our um, 
Our clinicians are LPNs and RNs. We are five-star um, service. We have a proven reimbursement success rate. Um, we, uh, we are an extension of the practice itself. We, um, my lead care manager is nationally certified um, managed care nurse. So she's very, has a wealth of knowledge into all of these programs and how they work and co-mingle mingle with one another. We look at the patient onboarding, getting those patients enrolled. We set up a very specific way with the practice, how they want to manage that. And then we help facilitate the onboarding of the patient. We complete all of the patient monitoring for, for our practices. The nurses receive through a software that we receive all of the patient's um, vital signs. We're able to go in and do any documentation. It alerts us immediately when the the patient takes their blood pressure. And if the patient has not been called back and it has not been addressed in the system, um, it alerts me to let me know that there's a delay. We provide RPM reporting to our physicians. Um, we upload, we have the software that we've chosen to work with is a NELTO. And NELTO can interface with many different um, EHR systems. If they are not one that you're already interfaced with, their team will work to create an interface. We provide that reporting um, into the system. We put, usually we will upload the document into the PAQ for the physician to sign off in. And then we make sure that we create the encounter and we create, um, we put the documents in the appropriate place for the billing purposes. We can do the billing part for the RPM or we are a revenue cycle company. So we are happy to do the revenue cycle as well. But some physicians elect for us just to go into their system and kind of go ahead and push that code out for them. And then of course, we wanna bring RPM payment. So we monitor all of our providers that we provide the service for before we do the billing. At the end of the month, we create a spreadsheet that goes to our internal coding team. We have a very large um, coding team. They're all certified coders that will go and look at every um, patient encounter we touch to make sure that we've met all the elements of the code before we bill it. So that's how we've been able to provide um, the proven reimbur reimbursement success for our clients. Next slide. These are just from a perspective of what you're doing in your practice, whether you were to work with us or you wanna do it independently and you just wanna have conversations about how do I get this going. <clears throat> you know, The specialties, chronic care management, as I talked about, really couples with RPM in a lot of cases, because these patients are normally very sick. We're trying to prevent that readmission. We're trying to prevent those unnecessary ER visits. Any patient who has, um, a, has an acute episodic or a chronic condition can have this, um, this program, right? But cardiology, pulmonology, endocrinology, we see a lot of OBGYN using it with hypertension and behavioral health. So a lot of people will say, well, how do you do this in behavioral health? When we think about behavioral health or we think of patients that have um, you know, anxiety, depression, um, different disorders, bipolar, those, those types of disorders, they, a lot of them will have hypertensive episodes, right? So they can go into a hypertensive crisis, they can have weight gain from their, um, either the disease process itself or the medications they're on. They could, um, there are certain medications that patients take that we need to follow certain lab values for like white blood cells or lithium type of um, levels. So with all of that, we provide the additional support to make sure the patient is going out and getting what they need as far as the labs. And that when we see that come across, we can, you know, cue that up for the physician to say, hey, just so you know, this is ready so that our patient's medication can be adjusted. These are some of the current um, different types of devices we're utilizing. We have a scale, we have a, a thermometer, blood pressure cuff, spirometry, pulse ox, glucometer, activity tracker, activity tracker, and fall detect. So one of the things with activity tracker that I like to talk about is a lot of times patients go home and they just don't move, right? They've come out of a situation where they've been in a hospital, they've gotten a new diagnosis, they're scared, they don't know what they should do, what they shouldn't do. The activity tracker encourages the patient to move, right? We're gonna, go, we're gonna monitor how much you're moving. 
it lets us know when the patient is labile and maybe something's going on and we need to address that with the patient as well. Hey, Mr. Smith, I noticed, you know, for the past two days that you've not really been moving around. Is something going on? Oh, well, my ankles are really swollen today. And so it really hurts when I walk. Then we know we need to let the physician know Mr. Smith is having um, more swelling than normal. His, he has not used his scale and we saw that his activity tracker not, notified us that he's not been moving very much. So the physician can get that patient into the office and do that chronic disease management part that keeps that patient from going to the hospital. And I love that activity tracker, especially post-surgical patients, those kind of things, the ones we wanna make sure that we're not developing pulmonary embolisms of, or things of that nature. But um, it's one that I think we in the past have not thought about but it's very relevant. So next slide. What does end ear and care management solutions look like? <clears throat> Health Prime, RPM, we deliver a 24 seven care delivery center. We, our equipment supports 22 supported language, languages. We connect with real-time care. We do relevant da data delivery real-time and available um, in clinical tool suites. We can use secure emails, text messages, smartphone apps, or an interface to do so. We look at the analytics and the trends of the patients, and we have the we have the billing team, right? So we've been in the RCM business since 2004. Our secure platform has 24/7 voice, data, and video. I love to show the two monitors that are at the top here. One looks like a Google Nest, and one says Remote Care on top. When a patient takes their blood pressure, if you say to me, I'm enrolling Mr. Smith, well, let's say Ms. Smith, because Mr. Smith's been in a lot of my conversation, we're enrolling Ms. Smith, and I would like for you, her blood pressure to be between 130, 135 and 140 systolic, and I want it to be between 75 and 85 diastolic. We're gonna put that into the software. When Ms. Smith takes her blood pressure, and sends it over, if that blood pressure is not within the parameters we've set for Ms. Smith, the remote care uh, module will chime. Ms. Smith will press that and it will start asking her questions. Are you having chest pain? Are you having shortness of breath? Have you taken your medication today? It'll field a bunch of questions, however we set it up. When that reading goes over to the nurse, it will already have these fielded questions in place. And at that point, we are able to go reach back out to the patient and start talking to them about, you know, we see that you've had a high blood pressure. This is what's going on. We see that you've answered these questions. They are having chest pain. Of course, that's something we need to start taking care of right away. It's a great tool to be able to keep the patient, um, get a bunch of answers right in the beginning. The one next to it, that, to the left, that looks like the Google Nest, this one you can actually, um, press the button and have a telehealth visit right from the patient's home, right from this monitor. So we have the ability to do that as well. It also allows them to do wellness information assessments and surveys. Um, the patient, it's a plug and play. The devices are, are paired prior to shipping. We do a 24 seven voice centric connection. It collects the data. It's all cellular built in, no Wi-Fi is needed and it's easy to use and secure. Next slide. This, we won't go over this like in detail, but this is what supporting your patient with top of the line secure technology platform. Um, you know, it's conversational AI, patient engagement and alerts. We, we're capturing data, we're capturing analytics, we're capturing reporting, comprehensive technology, automation for billing success, and the best device management um, platform in the industry is, who, is what we use. It's a Nelto. Moving forward. So the next steps, if anyone is interested in having more conversation, um, you can reach out to myself or Robin um, Wisniewski. I say it wrong all the time. She is my nationally certified managed care nurse, but we are happy to set up some time with you guys, go through any questions you may have, or see if there's a way that we can help service your patient population. I know we're getting close to our time, but I do want to make sure if anyone has any questions that we can address those here. Thank you, Tina. So please, um, we will be sending this out so you will have the contact information for um, both of these contacts. Uh, thank you, Tina, for being our presenter today.
And um, we do not have any questions at this time, but I'm gonna leave it up. So if anyone has a question, you can send it in. Um, I thought of one question, if you could maybe talk a little bit about how that process goes for patients getting the device, where the device is coming from and how they, it gets to them. Absolutely. So when we have a new patient enroll, we um, alert our, our vendor who is Analto. Um, Analto is based in Dallas, Texas. They are the original, the original device was I've fallen and I can't get up. Um, so Analto would ship the device to the patient's home. Once the patient receives the device, Analto calls the patient, makes sure that the setup is there, walks them through what the, their daily routine will be with it, um, sets it up where it chimes them at their daily time they agree to. If the patient finishes the um, program or if the patient no longer participates, the patient just simply mails it back in the self address box and Analto then um, there's no charge to the patient. If the equipment was to fail to work, which I have not had happen yet, but if that did happen, Anelta also sends the replacement the same way. Nice, so that really alleviates the device management stress and workload from the Absolutely. practices. Absolutely, and you don't have to have a big closet somewhere where you're tracking devices. Well, thank you so much, Tina, and thank you everyone for joining our webinar today. If you do think of a question, please feel free to email Robin or Tina, and we will send out the re uh, recording and slides to you later this week. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you for joining. Have a great day.